Ah, delightful beige. Smooth curves. A zip drive? That can only mean one thing. It's time for some Power Macintosh. Power Macintosh is here. The future is better than you expected. If you were to distill home computers in the 90s down to one word, it would be multimedia. But there is a new technology revolution underway, and it's called multimedia, redefining the way we create and consume information and entertainment. The word was everywhere. The launch of the CD-ROM in 1988 sparked an information and entertainment explosion throughout the entire following decade. Thus began the multimedia personal computer, exposing us to a new world of digital experiences through the CD-ROM, rich audio and video, and the World Wide Web. Apple was no exception to this. They'd embraced multimedia in the Mac for years with their Performa line of home computers. But by 1997, Apple was quickly changing. The company was in significant financial strife. Several large-scale failed projects over the last half decade had taken its toll, leading to its merger with Next and the return of Steve Jobs after a 12-year absence. As part of the restructuring, Apple began to refocus on what made the Mac great. In April of 1997, Apple and Disney co-hosted a special three-day multimedia discovery technology fair at Walt Disney World. It was to showcase, quote, the power and fun of multimedia with performance only the Macintosh can deliver. It was here Apple would debut the fastest Mac ever up to that point, the Power Macintosh 6500-300, which they dubbed the world's first 300 megahertz personal computer. Apple Computer launched a new line of computers called the Power Macintosh 6500. The systems can run at speeds up to 300 megahertz, performing tasks up to twice as fast as the fastest Pentium MMX computer. I was lucky enough to come across this one recently. It's supposedly working, but from the outside it's pretty clear it needs a little love and attention. At launch, the 6500-300 came equipped with 64 megs of RAM, a 4GB hard drive, a 12x speed CD-ROM drive, and a built-in iOmega ZIP100 drive. At its heart is a 300MHz second-gen PowerPC processor and an ATI RAGE 2 graphics chipset. How's that for 1997 nostalgia? This all retailed for a cool $3,000. Adjusting for inflation would bring that up to just over $5,100 in 2021. The Instatower case is rounded and curved, almost like a pufferfish. I love it. Mine has some pretty intense black marks from where it looks like it rubbed up against something. I wouldn't be surprised if it's been stored in a basement or a storage room for the past decade or two. The plastics are a bit yellowed. Hopefully a Retrobrite will help bring it back closer to its natural beige. Also, mine wobbles just a bit. Yeah, there's a couple of feet missing. So we definitely have a couple things to fix after the disassembly. But first, come on, it has a built-in zip drive. 1997 is definitely that sweet spot when three and a half inch floppy disks were on the way out and alternative disks were all the rage. So this is a nice feature, if it works. Under this are the CD-ROM and floppy drives built into the design of the case. Then below that is the media cluster. A volume control sits between a three and a half millimeter headphone jack and a circle. This is in fact an infrared port. This is used with a remote and hints at some more of the 6500's multimedia options. Then a grill for the built-in subwoofer, and yes, of course it has a built-in subwoofer, the classic Rainbow Apple logo, and the computer's model badge. Turning things around, the 6500 offers a rather unique set of ports and expansion slots for a home computer of this era. At the very bottom is, well, a hole. This is for one of several COM slot 2 cards. This would have shipped with a modem, but mine's missing for some reason. Both Apple and third parties also made other options for this, including Ethernet. Above this is a blank plate. The 6500 has several, shall we say, odd expansion ports, which we'll get into in a little bit. But for the moment, to the right of this are the computer's main two expansion slots. These are in fact PCI. Yeah, just like on a PC. Many PCI video cards worked with the Mac, as well as cards for networking, USB, Firewire, and more. These slots are mounted vertically for reasons that might become obvious a little bit later on. Moving further up the left side, we have 3.5mm audio out and in jacks, 25-pin SCSI, 9-pin serial modem and printer ports, a single ADB port, 
and another one of those blank plates. Just uh, ignore these for now. At the very top sits a soft power button, as well as the standard 15-pin Macintosh video port, and finally yet another blank plate. Okay, so what's the deal with all these blank spots? This computer has PCI slots, right? Well, yes, but in addition to PCI, Apple also integrated some unique multimedia expansion directly into a few Macs from this era. Together, these three ports correspond to three optional expansion kit systems that Apple offered separately. Back down at the bottom, the first is for an external video connector. The Apple Presentation System Kit allowed the Mac's display to be mirrored out to a TV, a projector, or even recorded by a VCR in high quality. This would have been a pretty great option for classrooms and other learning environments. The second, middle spot, is for Video In. The Apple Video System Kit equipped Macs with full RCA audio, composite video, and S-Video inputs that could capture analog audio and video from external sources. And finally, the third slot at the top is for a TV tuner. The Apple TV Video System Kit bundled the previous kit with a TV tuner card. This allowed you to watch and record live broadcast TV in a window on your Mac, as well as use all of the video in features provided by the Video System Kit. These kits are fascinating in and of themselves. I definitely want to do a video on at least one in the future. For now though, let's move on to the disassembly and a deeper cleaning. An important thing about this Tower Mac, opposed to almost all other tower computers, is that you don't access its logic board from the side. Instead, it's on rails and mounted inside with an edge connector. Well, isn't that just handy? Up at the top, we have two sticks of RAM, probably 32 megabytes each, as well as one stick of cache that would have been different between the various 6500 models. Down at the bottom, it looks like there's a fan, but it's not really attached to the heatsink. It's just kind of dangling there. I'm not sure this PowerPC shipped with a fan, so this must have been a user modification. In fact, I know it was, given this wiring job. Then there's a very dusty heatsink covering the PowerPC 603E processor. And beside it is the ATI RAGE 2 graphics chip. Also down here is one of those 4.5 volt clock batteries. And the two PCI slots. Now we can see why they're mounted vertically. They've got a little riser board. Under this is the COM slot 2 connector. It looks sort of like PCI and even uses the same bus, but the connector is not compatible. Up along the top edge is the video in slot for that optional card with composite and S-video. And back near the bottom is the tiny connector for external video out. Then of course, the absolute unit of an edge connector, which links the logic board to everything else inside the case. Okay, before anything else, let's ditch this fan. Huh, it's from StarTech. That's neat. As expected, the inside of the case looks mighty dusty. Since I want to do a thorough cleaning, we'll need to take the case completely apart. Doing so requires popping the front case off first, and I'm using a plastic card to avoid scratching it. There are three or four tabs on each side to pop open. The bottom ones are the hardest, but once they release you can just move upward to get to the rest. I went very slowly because I was afraid I would break the aging plastic, but the case itself seems to still be flexible. Once the front is off, it's the same thing for the zip drive's cover. And now we can start to see a bit more of the internals. But wait, what's going on with this hard drive? It looks as though the sled that it's mounted to has detached inside the case. So real quick, let's just disconnect its power and IDE cables. It's a 41.1 GB IBM DeskStar drive from April 2001. A nice upgrade! This sled, though, has seen better days. These parts in particular are one of the most common in old Macs that can just shatter. Whatever plastic they are made from just becomes super brittle over time. As I was moving the case around, small pieces of this kept falling out. These bits can be sharp but I might be able to salvage it. Both the CD-ROM and zip drive are also mounted on a sled like this. Next up is the top piece, which can now just slide back to detach. Okay, now that the front and top are off, the sides can come next. It's pretty clear that Apple never really intended you to open the sides, unless absolutely necessary. All of the major user serviceable pieces, the drives, the RAM, the expansion cards, are accessible by removing the logic board or the front panel which explains why getting further into this case is a headache. 
The side panels are held on by a locking clip, which must be pushed up to move the panel back. I'm being very careful not to break this off, which makes the process all the more frustrating. Eventually, though, it yields, and I can get the card underneath. After a little more, uh, persuasion, the panel slides off. And if you're expecting an open case at this point, well, I meant it when I said they didn't want you opening this. Okay, but what about the other side? Oh, bother. We'll be able to go further, we'll just have to remove a bunch of screws. Then I guess the next thing is the feet. Followed by the back panel, starting with the TV tuner port at the top. Its video in cable is so nicely clipped onto the back of the plate. And then the back panel itself. The final bits of plastic to remove for retrobriding are from the logic board. First are the two expansion plates. Then I'll need to remove the PCI slot covers. And then the PCI riser card. But then I realized it's held on by a screw on the back. Then I can remove the two screws holding the back plate to the board itself. Oh, but the two standoffs on the SCSI port are also holding it on. This plastic is not easily separated from its metal frame, but I can at least remove its grounding brackets. With that, all of the plastics are removed and can be scrubbed before the Retrobrite. To start the cleaning, I have some glass cleaner, 99% isopropyl alcohol, and paper towels. I'll start with a quick wipe down of glass cleaner to get loose dust and dirt before moving on to spot cleaning. A dab of isopropyl alcohol then works really well to remove the tough grime with just a bit of light scrubbing. I'm very careful around the badges to avoid damage from the alcohol. A few stubborn spots can benefit from some alcohol on the end of a cotton swab. But even still, the darkest black marks aren't fully going away, so I'll try a magic melamine sponge. These have the potential to take off the plastic's powder-like finish, so I'll use it very carefully without too much pressure. Time and patience is your friend here. The top panel had a few dark spots. I was able to remove nearly all of it, and while it's not perfect, it's still a world of difference better. There was also a large mark on the back panel's air grill that took some time to remove. The logic board's faceplate was relatively clean, with just a bit of grime around its handles. The sides carried the bulk of the marks and scuffs. I spent a good 30 minutes of scrubbing between the two. Thankfully though, I was able to remove nearly all traces of them. Cleaning like this can go a long way to making an old piece of tech feel new. Now it's time for the Retrobrite. I'll fill my two clear tubs with just enough water to cover the pieces, and then pour in one bottle of 40 volume hair developer each. Then I'll let it sit here in the sun for a few hours, coming out now and then to shake off any bubbles that have formed. For the logic board's faceplate, which is still attached to exposed metal, I thought I'd instead try the cream method. This consists of a layer of 40 volume cream developer painted between some plastic wrap and the piece. I have hope that by reducing any water that's up against the metal, there'd be far less opportunity for rusting. I just need to package it all up tight so the developer is somewhat evenly spread. And then it's outside it goes. While the plastics are lightly poaching, let's move on to a deep cleaning of the case internals. First I want to remove the CD-ROM drive, as I suspect, like the hard drive, its bracket is also broken. It connects inside with a set of edge adapters. That's neat. And sure enough, its bracket shows the same signs of broken tabs. Hopefully some super glue can help later on. But now it's time to go deeper into Fort Knox. After removing all nine screws, the sides still wouldn't budge. 
but a bit of manual motivation helped it along. Ah, there we go. Inside, we can see the large power supply on the left, drive cages on the right, and the computer's girthy subwoofer on the bottom. The first piece I'll remove is the hard drive cage. At the center sits the bulk of the internal cabling, routed through one large clip. Just below this is a plastic cable guide, but it seems to have broken in half at some point. Probably best to remove it for now and look for the rest later. Next, I'll remove the subwoofer, which is held in with four rubber dampened screws. This is definitely the strangest internal speaker I've seen in a computer. Then there's a plastic separator for the logic board area. Oh, and there's the other half of that cable guide. And two more bits of broken plastic from the clips that once locked the front bezel on. The subwoofer's audio cable routes all the way to the top on this small daughter board. I'll disconnect the main power cable and then unclip the rest of the bundle. Then I can disconnect and pull the subwoofer cable through, followed by the power supply. The CD-ROM's back bracket appears to have a broken clip, but I found the piece in the bottom of the case. I then reattached it with a dab of superglue. Likewise, I was able to rejoin the two halves of the cable guide in the same way. I left both pieces for a few hours to fully cure. And from here, it's just a deep cleaning to loosen and remove the years of dust. I chose to leave the zip and floppy drives in place as their brackets appeared intact and I didn't want to risk breaking them. Checking in on the Retrobrite, it looks as though after only two hours the logic board's faceplate is done. I'll bring it inside and rinse it off thoroughly, then use some compressed air to ensure the metal is well dried. The plastic looks fantastic. There is, however, some white accumulation on the metal. I don't think this will harm anything, though. A little while later, the first batch of water-treated pieces are done as well. After a rinse with the garden hose, they look pretty spot on. Now I'll swap in the last two pieces. To help them stay submerged, I added small weights with gaffer tape on the undersides. These should be able to soak up the last few hours of sun today. After both inside and outside are thoroughly cleaned, we're ready for reassembly. With a bit of time and superglue, I was able to reattach the broken tabs to the CD-ROM and hard drive sleds. Alright, the two missing feet. There was nothing at my hardware store that quite matched, but then I had a thought. I have some thick, high-density EVA foam used for crafting and cosplay. Turns out it's exactly the same thickness as one of the feet. So I measured out and cut a couple of replacements and applied some spray adhesive to one side. Turns out they work just about perfectly.
After a week-long journey of cleaning and restore, this Power Mac is back. It's so much fun looking at where it was to where it is now. Restoring a piece of tech can really show how it can shine, despite being 24 years old. At the same time, it shows us a little bit of how we got to today. And now that it's back together, let's power it up for the first time and look around. Well, the time is reset, so my bet is that clock battery is long expired. And it looks like it's running a stock install of macOS 9.1. I suppose the seller likely wiped the hard drive. Clearly then, the first thing we need to try is the zip drive. So I'll unbox a new old stock gigapack of zip 100 disks. And to my surprise, it works! Ooh, click here. Don't mind if I do. How many ways can you use your zip disks? Choose any of these categories to find out how iOmega make managing and sharing your data faster and easier than ever. Oh my. Zip disks are the perfect way to manage your digital audio and music collections. Uh-huh, sure Jan. Maybe that's enough zip disks for one day. So with nothing much else to do, why not have a little fun? Let's pull out one of my favorite games from 1999, SimCity 3000. Turns out the intro movie is just a bit much for it. It might perform better with 128 megs of RAM. But otherwise, despite a lag here and there, the game runs pretty well. And I'm honestly surprised by the sound coming from the built-in speaker. It's not great, but it's not terrible either. Gosh, I have such nostalgia for this game. I spent hours as a kid after school here enjoying the smooth, colorful scenery and the beautiful architecture. I fondly remember all of the city advisors, petitioners, and that puntastic news ticker. And I definitely can't forget this game's amazing soundtrack with a wonderful mix of jazz and new age tracks. Of course, half the fun in building your city was always saving and then letting loose a disaster or two. Yeah, I'll lose a few hours here if I don't wrap this up quick. This Power Macintosh 6500-300 might not be the fastest, sleekest, most colorful Mac ever made, but in my opinion, it's still worthy of attention. This restore has come out wonderfully, and I have further plans for this Mac. So look forward to one or two more videos coming up where I explore more of the 6500-300's multimedia capabilities. And as always, happy restoring and thank you for watching.